Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Irv Yalom and Lori Gottlieb to our series. We invite you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel for over 300 conversations. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is Live Talks LA. Irv's book, co-authored with his late wife, Marilyn, is a matter of death and life. He is Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. He has devoted his career to counseling those suffering from anxiety and grief, and his books have been published in 30 languages. He has written fiction and nonfiction, and his classic textbooks are Inpatient Group Psychotherapy and Existential Psychotherapy, which have trained generations of therapists. Lori Gottlieb is a psychotherapist and author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. In addition to her clinical practice, she writes the Atlantic Weekly's Dear Therapist advice column and is co-host of the popular Dear Therapists podcast. I am Ted Haptegaber, founder and producer of the series. Welcome, everyone. They will talk, and towards the end, I will pose some questions that came from you in the audience. Take it from here, Lori. Well, hi, Irv. It's great to see you. Hi, Lori. Nice to see you. So just to let people know, you're about to turn 90. And even long before I became a therapist, I had been reading your books and following your work. And what you did in terms of sharing your humanity in the therapy room really revolutionized the field. And I think it's safe to say that you have inspired and educated many thousands of clinicians around the world. And by extension, I think helped all of the clients who came to see them. But I think more than that, you've changed the lives of millions of readers who have seen themselves in your books. So today we're going to talk about your latest book, A Matter of Death and Life. And it's probably also your most personal. And this is something that you co-wrote with your wife, Marilyn, as she was dying of cancer. And it is an absolutely magnificent memoir that is both a love story and a heartbreaking story of grief. And I think more than that, it asks us to ask ourselves the important questions about our own lives. You, you don't allow us to look away. And so I think what's fascinating about this book, A Matter of Death and Life, is that like in your other books, you let us into your inner world, but this time it's not in relation to your patients, it's in relation to the most important person in your life, which is your wife, Marilyn. And just so that people understand the context for this book, can you tell us a little bit about how you met back when you were, I think, 14 years old? Okay, uh, well, I can't help noticing how labile I am as I hear you talking about it. I'm already tearing up. It's quite amazing to me as I kind of watch myself and what I'm doing in, in my time of grief. But the the question you were asking about how this book began, uh, and there's a picture on the on the cover of Marilyn and me walking along a, a path near a park, right uh, a block or two from our home. Uh, that's the path, and we were walking along just like that. And um, Marilyn says to me, "You know, I, I've been thinking. I think you and I should should write a book together about what's happening now to me and to a, to my life and to this cancer. So I think you and I should write a book together." Uh, and uh, I responded saying, you know, I think that's, that's a great idea for a book for you, Marilyn. Uh, I, I'm just starting on another book of stories, though. So, you, you know, you go ahead and do this book. Uh, Marilyn was only uh, 100 pounds, uh, but she's very tough and, and quite, uh, quite staunch in in her her ideas and she said oh no no you're not you're not writing that book you're writing this book with me and um and so that's how this book started and from that point on until she died uh she and i wrote alternating chapters and after she died i wrote the last part of the book myself looking at uh what was happening to me and, and studying my own grief the, the interesting point, though, that I wanted to make is that this, that's only half the story. The other half of the story took place, oh, something like, uh, what, like uh, 70 years before that, uh, when I first met her. The, uh, I first met her by crashing a party at her home and uh, climbing in through the window with uh, one of the bowling alley 
guys that I used to bowl with. I didn't know who she was, but I saw her and it was the first woman I think I'd ever talked to. Uh, we, we were both 14 and went over and um, I got her phone number and I called her uh, the next day and we set up a date for the following day and we were meeting at an ice cream sh store uh, near her home and 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 uh, and we, we uh, and, and we met there and then she told me she was very tired because she had uh, she had uh, skipped school that day and I said you skipped school that day I knew she was an outstanding student she's always the valedictorian of her class she said yes she'd stayed up all night reading uh, the book um, oh, what book was it? A Gone with the Wind. Uh, it's a long book, uh, and uh, it's a movie with Clark Gable later on. But she'd stayed up all night reading that book, and she just couldn't go to school the next day. And I was absolutely flabbergasted when I saw that. Uh, the idea that she would so much love reading just appealed to me tremendously because I spent a lot of my childhood reading. Uh, I grew up in a very, uh, very poor, uh, dangerous neighborhood. It was not safe outside and spent a lot of time at the library and always reading. So this is the first person I ever met who seemed to care as much about books that I do. So, so our relationship started with that story and ends with the story of our writing this book together. Now, you guys grew up very close to each other, but you grew up in very different neighborhoods. So you had very different kinds of upbringings. Yeah. And you were drawn to her because she was somebody who shared your passion for reading was was um you know very interested in the life of the mind what do you think drew her to you i think it was books i i don't think she probably met anyone who i used to write a lot of poetry i before our first time that we were together uh, when we went to visit my home i'm reading the things that i had had written talking about all the books i was reading uh, books were so much a part of my life i think that's what drew her to me uh, there wasn't much else uh, i was uh, uh, very anxious uh, i had uh, really no manners i had hardly ever talked to a girl before she was always the most popular girl in her class i was pretty friendless until i uh, joined a high school school fraternity that was very helpful to me. So I guess that's what drew her to me. Uh, and I, I think the fact that we, we, we shared this love of writing right from the beginning of our lives. And, and it turns out that that became a big thread through your marriage, where I think she edited a lot of your work and you edited a lot of hers, or at least gave feedback on it. And you I think you matched each other book for book throughout your lifetimes. Um, what has it been like? So you wrote the first half of the book with her and she was editing your work. What about the second half of the book after she had died? What was it like for the first time in your life not having Marilyn there as your editor, especially because this material was so much about your marriage? Yeah, that was a new experience for me. She always read everything that I wrote. Uh, and she was always my first reader. And I was always her first reader, although she was a, a better editor than I was. She was the head of her of the high school uh, newspaper too, so she she really knew her way around the editing. So um, trying trying to write this with without Marilyn was 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 an unusual experience for me. Um, and um, uh, what what happened really after after she died, I was entering into uh, grief, beginning to experience what that was like. Uh, one of the things that I did to help me was to, I, I looked at a whole row of my books in, in my bedroom, of my own books. I never really reread any of the books I'd written, and I started reading them over again. Very interesting experiment experience for me, uh, in that it was so helpful. And each time I read a book, I said, did I write this? Where, where did I get this idea from? How did I do this? And then I picked up a book that's called Mama and the Meaning of Life, a book of stories. And I was astonished when I looked at, the, I think, the second or third story in that book, which which is entitled uh, something like Eight Advanced Lessons in the Therapy of Grief. A therapy of grief, I'd forgotten all about that. And I reread that story with with, uh, with astonishment. And it was, this, it was an interesting story. It, it was the story of a, of a woman who had not only lost her husband, uh, she was a college professor at Stanford, but she'd also lost her, her brother uh, a couple of years before that. She was in deep grief, and I tried to uh, to work with her, uh, but somehow she, she, she was very 
uh, 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 at, at times very combative with me. And she keeps saying, oh, you, you know, you, you don't know what I'm feeling. You sit there in that nice pink striped shirt. Nothing's ever happened to you. Uh, you've led such a ideal life, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we would, we would, uh, we would argue like that. I would say to her, oh, you mean I got to be depressed to treat a depressed patient? Or do I have to be schizophrenic to work with a schizophrenic patient? Well, we'd have these arguments sort of, yo, almost shouting at one another but now that i'm i'm going through i've gone through a lot of grief about marilyn now i i really know how she felt and now i think she was right uh i think i could work with a patient in grief so much better than i could now i, I really know what she was going through as she talked about her numbness and her depression so that was that was one of the experiences i had during the grief of, of rereading my my own material I remembered that story and I remembered, you know, there, there's something very interesting about being a therapist where people often will say to us as therapists, you can't possibly understand. You're not going through this exact experience. You don't know what it feels like. And I think there is that knee jerk reaction to say, well, I can imagine it, but you can't really imagine it. And I think that's what's so beautiful about your your ability to acknowledge what you know and what you don't know. And, and in this case, um, you know, it wasn't until Marilyn died that I think you fully understood what that patient meant. Mm -hmm. Because as you have gone through your grief and you write about in your book, um, you experience all of these things that are quite surprising to you. One of them is that um, you start to think a lot about sex, mm -hmm. which was <laughs> which was something that that I think you know wasn't what you had anticipated, especially given how gutted you yeah. were. Yeah. after Maryland died. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was, it was thinking about sex much more than I usually do. It was also thinking particularly about women's breasts. Uh, I somehow I got fixated on that in a way that I never had before. Uh, I think it has a, a lot to do with my with my mother, with my needing nurturance, perhaps. But that that was one a, a, a very strange experience. But I knew a lot about that as I started to read some of my own work. Uh, many many of the patients that I saw who might have a coronary and start to grope the nurses in the ambulance uh, as though they want to get re reunited with this vital force in life again as they feared the the ending of it so that was that was certainly one experience and and the kind of numbness that i felt was another and the kind of sessions that i had like the sexual obsessions i could not get him out of my mind i had this obsession of somehow thinking about tiananmen square in china and the tanks running over the students maybe that was because on tv there's some hong kong riots that were being in the news just at that time and maybe that made me think but i didn't want to think about those things but i could not get them out of my mind so i had a real education uh, about what what grief was really like and I, I could see the things that set me back. One day I decided, well, we've got two cars. Uh, I, I'll sell one of the cars now. I fill up the garage so I don't need it. So I sold Marilyn's car. And I went out the next day and I, I get, got thrown into a terrible depression as I saw her car was there. Uh, that hit me so hard. Um, so uh, I, 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 I knew from the very beginning that my prognosis was not going to be good. I rarely worked. I worked with a lot of people who were in grief, uh, but I, I never worked with anyone who had this kind of uh, lifelong attachment to the person. Uh, there was a time that I was leading groups of of of, uh, of women of women and men who had lost their spouses. I, I led that group for 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 many years. So I consider myself a rather an expert in working with grief. But now I realize how much I didn't know about it at the time. Well, I think what you're also talking about is comparative grief, where a lot of people, like you just said, you know, I had this experience where I was attached to this person for over 60 years, and so my grief, I knew I was going to have a lot of difficulty with, um, but. But I think that a lot of people would take issue with that and they would say, well, just because you spent longer with this person doesn't mean that your grief is more profound. And um, and I think that people tend to do that in grief and that comes up too, where I think you're so um, willing to lay yourself bare and say things, um, you know, that I'm sure your patients have said to you all the time, you know, no one could understand because I had this relationship with this person or I lost a child and nobody could understand what that is like. Yeah. Um, and I think you also, talk about 
anticipatory loss, which is that grief doesn't start when, after the person dies. Um, you know, in, in the case of some something like you went through with Marilyn, um, I think that you were grieving from the moment you realized that this was going to kill her. Because when she first got her diagnosis, I think both of you felt rather optimistic about her prognosis, that she could live with this for quite a while, and then things turned very quickly in a different direction. Um, and so there's this moment where, you know, you're in denial about this and she is not. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really interesting about the book is that, you know, when she's writing a chapter, she's very clear about how much time she has left. And you have this, you know, way of, of, of not, really, not really facing it. And at one point she says, I wonder if I'll be around during the holidays. And you say to her, well, what are you talking about? Of course, you'll be around during the holidays. And she writes in her chapter that she didn't quite know what to do with that because she knew that she might not be around during the holidays. And she didn't know whether it would be kinder to you yeah. to indulge your denial or to help you to see reality. And she, she was sort of stuck about what to do about that. And I imagine that that's a common experience for people who are dying and the person or the people around them who love them are in denial about it. Yes, this is, uh, is absolutely right on. Uh, she was suffering a great deal. I knew a little bit about her disease, multiple myeloma. I know that it's, it's treatable. Many people live 15, 20 years with it. We tried everything with her. Every one of them failed. Uh, but it was very hard for me to really acknowledge that, the, that she was not really treatable uh, with that. And then finally, she, she was suffering so much and, uh, and she decided that she wanted to have a, a physician assisted death at that point. And, and we, we were already involved with a hospice. And in California, if there, there are two MDs who sign that she has a fatal illness and, uh, and that she's asking to have a physician assisted death. Uh, so she did that. But there was a time that she said to me, uh, this is it, Irv. I, I can't, I can't, I can't go any longer. Uh, so we called him, and he came over that as quickly as he could with uh, with medication. And the laws are that the patient has to take the medication herself or himself. Um, and and she did that. He 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 ground up these pills and put it in the lotion, and she she had to suck it uh, suck it up through a straw. And I was with her. She asked that her children, her four children, were there, and so we we had to wait till they all arrived a couple of hours, and so we were all with her at that point. And uh, and I watched her uh, suck the medication through a straw, and I, I just counted her breaths after that, and I counted about sixteen breaths, and 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 she slipped away, and I leaned over and and uh, kissed her forehead at that point. She was already ice cold. It was uh, something I'll never forget. Uh, and I can't get it out of my mind either. I'm not so sure it was a good idea for me to see that. But it's, it's a thought that I, I keep on thinking and keep on seeing in my mind. Um, and um, But she did the right thing. And if I were in her situation, I, I would too. Uh, and it depends too on what state you live in in the United States. Some of the states uh, uh, you can do that. Some of the states don't have that kind of law. Some of the states are perhaps a little bit more lenient, like like Oregon, for example. Some of the countries, uh, like Switzerland, uh, uh, you know, for example, are, or the Netherlands are, are, are you're much easier to get physician-assisted death at that point. I remember in the book when she first brought it up to you, and you wrote, "The thought of suicide is a great consolation. By means of it, one gets through many a dark night." And basically you were trying to humor her. You were saying, okay, you know, that that's okay. Um, I give you my blessing when you really did not You mm -hmm. were just trying to sort of mollify her so that she would know she always had an out no. if it got unbearable. No. Um, and then, you know, one of the, one of the things that comes back in the book a lot is Nietzsche's quote, die at the right time. Mm -hmm. And Marilyn was very aware of that. She wanted to die at the right time. And there's often a disconnect between what the person who's ill feels is the right time and what the people around them feel is the right time. And there's a lot of that tension in the book as Marilyn gets more and more clear about her condition and what she's willing to put up with in terms of quality of life 
um, where she really didn't have much quality of life at all at the end. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, what her responsibility was to the people around her. Can you, can you talk about the conversations that the two of you had around that? Well, I, I really was in, in denial. I, I really couldn't quite get my mind around how badly she really felt. Uh, once I walked into the room, the children were home. She was in a room with all of our children, giving away things to them, jewelry, things like that. I'm astonished. What are you doing? You know, she, she just casually gave away the things that we all treasure so much to the children and that absolutely astonished me so I was in denial for a long time but gradually gradually you know she couldn't walk out even out to the to the street a uh, hundred feet to the mailbox uh, and I it gradually became aware of the fact that, that she was suffering greatly and when she said it's time to call the, the doctor I, I did it immediately for her and I just wish that someone would be able to do that for me when my time came one of the things that you talk about is um, the ways that memory play, the, what, the role that memory plays in, you know, in people when we lose them. And you were talking about how you're so afraid of your memories getting dimmer and dimmer um, of, of, you know, this incredibly long, intimate relationship that you had. Um, one of the things you talked about was going back to, um, I think it was a reunion at Stanford, and nobody from your original cohort of, of clinicians that you had trained with was, was alive. And, and what it's like to be sort of like one of the last remaining survivors of your group. And, um, and, and, and part of that is not having them around now to talk to, and part of it is that you're losing all those memories. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. Uh, I, I knew, I was certain, Mar Marilyn had an unbelievable memory. I knew that when she died, a, a lot of my past was going to disappear. I had a good example of this last night. I was watching the uh, the uh, Ken, Ken Burns Hemingway series on, on PBS, and I watched the final two hours of that. And uh, and it was about Hemingway in World War Two, and it, and then I I recall that Marilyn helped and I wrote this article together. I think my name is just on it, but but she helped me. We went away for a long weekend. Somehow I don't know how. This is what Marilyn would have known. She had gotten hold of Xeroxes of some letters between Hemingway and the U.S. general who was invading who was invading France at that point at Normandy. And we had those letters and we wrote, I wrote an article about that for the Archives of General Psychiatry. I know a lot about Hemingway at that time, but I started to think about Marilyn and I say, well, where did we get these letters from? How could we have done it? And what was the general's name? I couldn't remember any of that. Oh, if Marilyn were only here. And, and then right at the end, about the last five minutes of the Hemingway show, they mentioned Buck Lanham, who was the, who was the U.S. general. And suddenly I remembered that that was him. And it, we had a series of letters that Hemingway had written to, to Buck Latham, and that was what really was the, the meat of the article that, that I had written for the, the example. But that, that's the sort of thing I meant. She would have recalled everything about these letters, where she got them from, how she'd gotten this Xerox of Hemingway's personal letters. I have no idea. I would love to, I'd love to know that story, but I'll never know it now. Yeah, there's all these things that you will never know. And then also just the, the personal stories between you or just the little moments between you. Like you, you were talking about how you saw these photos and you were on vacation and you couldn't remember where you were on vacation or, right. you know, the, the little things about your life that that, you know, when you say to your partner, where were we or what was that restaurant we went to or what happened with that person on this trip? She's not it, there to fill that in. Was it was always one way. It was always me asking her. She had a, ph a phenomenal memory uh, that uh, that always was there. Um, one of the, one of the memories that in in, in my grief here that uh, that came back to me was the uh, was when we first we went to Bellagio. There was a writers. Institute there, and I got a Rockefeller Prize to go to this institute in Bellagio in Italy, where um, where 
the the couple or the family went they had a nice apartment but then the the writer the person who got the award had this special writing room where he could he could he or she could write the book so while we were there marilyn was talking to me this was a long long time ago it was my first book and marilyn was talking to me about she'd been reading she's a, a french scholar french and german scholar that was her phd and she was telling me about the fact that uh, she's been reading a lot of stories uh, that have been written by eyewitnesses of the French Revolution, written by women. And there were, and she, more she talked about it to me, I was saying to her, you know, that's, she'd never written a book before, and this was one of my first books. And she was saying to me, I was telling me that, and I said, you know, there's a book in there, Marilyn, that, that sounds fascinating. Why don't we see if we could get you a, a writing studio too? So we went into the office uh, at Bellagio, and, and they said, very curtly, uh, you know, we don't give offices for spouses, wives, our uh, spouses, husbands. Um, and uh, just then the head of the, the Bellagio had come through the room. He said, wait a minute, there is an open office. Uh, and it was uh, in the woods, about five or 10 minutes away from the, from the major building there. We walked through the woods and they showed me there was a ladder going up to a tree house. Uh, in, in a, a very large tree in the woods there. And we walked up there and there was a wonderful little studio. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, so she absolutely loved it. And that's, uh, that's how she wrote her first book. And after that, uh, she matched me, I think almost book for book after that, every time. We were always writing books together. She was always my first reader, always my best editor. Uh, I, I was uh, her first reader all the time, but not nearly the kind of editor she was. So Irv, you know, it's interesting. I noticed that this in this conversation, you've been particularly emotional. Um, and I know that you've gone to therapy to help with your grief. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like for someone like you who is known as the master therapist in many circles, um, who has taught so many about the art of therapy, what it's like in this really challenging time in your life to go and see a therapist? Who did you choose? I mean, not the person's name, but what kind of therapist did you choose? And what are those sessions like? Well, I, I chose the therapist, uh, a, friend, a couple of friends of mine had, had seen her, um, and she, uh, I liked her so much, I think it's because she works very much like I do, uh, that's, but that, but she's very open. Wait, and, what do you mean by that she works like you do? Can you be Well, she, she's, she's very open. She's perfectly willing to talk about herself, talk about experiences she's had. Uh, she's, uh, she's quite a wonderful therapist, and I, I've, I've really... Uh, really treasured my my meetings with her for the past i would say maybe uh, probably four or five months now i think so uh it's been quite comforting to me there are times i'm feeling a little better and i think it's time to to stop but no no i'm i'm continuing to to meet with her it's it's kind of interesting for me to be in therapy i haven't been in therapy for a while maybe i don't know five or ten years i think so it's it's fascinating for me do you think, so going back to that patient who said, you don't really understand my grief, the one who was in her 40s and lost her husband, um, do you think that she understands your grief? I don't think she's had any particular personal experience with grief that I've heard, but she seems to understand my grief very well. Uh, and and she, what I like about her is that she's she's quite open. She's willing to express what she's feeling. Uh, she's not concealing herself. Contrast this with my very first experience in, in therapy. I was starting my residency. I had my three years of psychiatric training at Johns Hopkins, and the chief resident when I went into this class, you know, talked to me about therapy. Most most of us all got into therapy at the beginning. He told me about his analyst, who was a elderly woman in Baltimore who had analyzed a lot of the other analysts in town. So I started with her and I, I met with her four times a week for 
for three years. That's something like 200 hours. And, um, and she was very traditional analyst and she had her chair at the edge of the couch. So I didn't really see her unless I wanted to really bend my neck back to see her. And she never really talked about her own self in any way. Uh, and it was always kind of looking at transference, looking at my early life. And I feel it was, uh, it, it was very unhelpful to me. It was a lesson, a very long and expensive lesson to me in how not to do therapy. Uh, so that, that was, that was my, my first experience in therapy. But since then, I've, uh, I've not been bashful about getting into therapy. Some of it had to do with anxiety about, about death. Uh, early on in my uh, career, I was approached by a woman who had, uh, breast cancer that was metastatic that it spread to other parts of her body and there was no treatment for that and she came to see me quite a remarkable woman whose name was Katie and she asked me to start a group of, of patients who had this kind of cancer uh, I don't think to the best of my knowledge there was such a group that had ever been done before at least not reported or so but I uh, I gradually began to do that and we had a group of women who were all dying of metastatic cancer, and every single one of them died. And new people came in, and um, and that group went on for many years. And it, it began to get to me. My own death anxiety became stronger and stronger, and I needed some help with that. And I, uh, a, a very good psychologist who who knew something about this, named Rollo May, had just moved to California then. And I began working with him. I think I met with him about a year and a half. He helped me a lot. But I learned later, we became lifelong friends after that. I was with him when he died. But he told me later on that I had, that he had helped me with my death anxiety, but I had made his a lot worse. Uh, he was, uh, I think, 23 years older than I was and facing these issues long before I did. Um, so that, I, I, that, I think yeah. that's the thing that, that you know, you do, you, you, you write about and I write about um, is is how our patients hold up a mirror to us and, and and force us to ask these questions of ourselves and look at these issues in our own lives, right. and and you were one of I think the first therapists to really write openly about self disclosure, and there's a great story about um, recently when when you decided to retire and I want to put retire in quotes here because you're still seeing people I think for um, individual consultations yeah. but you decided to retire from ongoing long-term psychotherapy and a woman came to see you and she came from overseas and it was the 4th of July it was uh, and, and there she is at you your office is actually on, at your home and you come back from a, a celebration with your family at the park and there's this patient waiting there for you and you had no recollection of this. And instead of faking it, you told her that you had no recollection. And, and it, was, it was at first very upsetting to her because she had come from quite far away to come see you, but it ended up because of the self-disclosure, it ended up being a, a very productive session and, and very meaningful for her. Can you tell us about that session? Well, um, I, I had forgotten she was there and, and she, she was in, I have an office that's just a hundred, 150 feet from my home. So she was waiting outside there when I came and I was astonished and embarrassed, of course, when she was there. And gradually, as I began to talk to her, it all began to float back into my mind. This was a while ago, a few years ago, and um, it was a very embarrassing time. But but uh, it, it it ended up being quite quite positive. Since I what's the sense of concealing anything? You know, I t I told her exactly what was going on, and I totally forgotten, it, and I was terribly apologize uh, apologetic for for what it, it had happened, and it, it ended up I think being uh, being quite a quite a helpful session for her. Um, it so I tend to be. For some period of time now, I tend to be much more open than I ever expected to be. Uh, it's not because I have nothing to to hide, but I, I just it, for one, one. I'll give you one example of this. I, I started a group. I was always interested in group therapy. I had a lot of training in that because of a man named Jerome Frank at, at Hopkins, who was my mentor in that. And uh, from the very beginning of my training at Hopkins, I watched him do a group, and then I went into the group with him, leading leading groups. But uh, I, I was I was quite interested in, in group therapy and began to organize a group therapy program at Stanford and had a lot of students. And I would lead a therapy group 
and then the the residents about eight or ten of them would be in this next room and they watch through a one-way mirror so they could watch the group of course i had to tell the group that you know, they were being observed and that made them all edgy about that and they they didn't know what we were saying about them at the end and everything and i i could understand their feeling after a while after a while i just decided on the spot i was going to try an experiment and uh i i would i i said I said to them, I was already at that point being somewhat open with people because I would write a summary of the group and I would mail it to the patients after the group, what, what I was seeing in the therapy group. So I was already kind of being a little self-disclosing. But when they were complaining about the, the, the people watching and that was making them feel antsy, I say, listen, let's try something. At the end of this meeting, I want you all to go into the observation room and I'll be in the other room with my students and we'll be talking about the group right, right in front of you. Um, I don't know what gave me the courage to do that, but I had no qualms about that. And so for the rest of the life of that group, they were watching me and the students talking about talking about them in the group. Uh, and the, uh, the group was galvanized. It was uh, extremely important. They talk about how this particular person had it all wrong. That was what they really saw. So it was, it made the residents very nervous, I think. But good, they, they would, it was a good teaching lesson for them. I think, something, what it, I think yeah. what it does is it breaks down that wall, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's not this sort of wizard who's running the therapy and, and the patient doesn't know about their own life and that somehow the therapist knows more about the patient's life than the patient knows. And what you're saying is this is a collaborative process. We're going through this process of discovery together. And I'm reminded of that time you told me recently about you shared some of your early trauma with a patient who had experienced a lot of trauma and 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 the the session hadn't been going well at all until you disclosed something to her at the very end you showed her where you grew up you you had a book out can you share that story oh i forgot all about that story yes uh it was a a stanford student a, a woman about uh, 23 i think she was a grad student then and just before she had come to my office, I had gotten my first copy of the book uh, called my uh, memoir. Um, I know what's the name of that memoir. Anyway, I wrote it. I, I got my memoir. My memory is flaking away as I'm growing old now. It'll come back to me in about three minutes. But anyway, she was. I was reading that book. I put the book away, uh, and and uh, she came into my office and. Uh, she she had looked at some of my books and thought that she was going to try once again. She's been in therapy many many times, she said, and she told me about her life, and it was a it was a terrible story. She had been sexually abused when she was younger. Uh, she had been on drugs uh, many many times. Had been to lots of drug retreats where they were in the they were in the wilderness for a month or two. Lots of ways to kind of get herself off drugs, and and she wanted to she wanted to to try that a, again, and um, and uh, I I tried to talk her into starting therapy again. Told her I wasn't available. I was no longer offering therapy. I gave her the name of a very good therapist that I knew who she could work with. And, uh, and she left the office. As soon as she left the office, I went back to looking at my, at my memoir. And I was flying through the pages and I was, I was looking uh, at a picture of where I lived in Washington, D.C. It was really a horrible place over top of a grocery store with a kind of a rat infested neighborhood. And then she, I heard a knock at the door and she came back into my office and said, I forgot to give you this check. So she gave me the check and she was going to leave it again. And I, I called her over to my, as, I, as she's walking out of the door, I said, come, come over here. I want to show you something. Um, I'm going to cheer up again as I say this. But uh, I, I, I pointed to this picture of where I grew up, this picture of the little home over the grocery store. And I said, look at this. Uh, I said, it happened to be just open on my desk. I was just looking at it. So I said, take a look at this. This is where I came from. Uh, and then I said to her, you know, if I could climb out of this, you can too. That's all, that's all I said. And she left and that had an incredible effect on her and me too, as you see. Uh, so she did enter therapy and I think had a major life change. 
but the idea of that that's one of the stories that I, I may may put into this it's actually just the beginning of my starting to see patients in consultation but I just saw her that time oh I saw her one more time after that to choose a good therapist for her so that that was that story but again that's self-revelation and um you know I uh, I, I don't feel bashful about that. I don't know why, uh, but uh, but I was very willing to take a, a lot of chances like that early on in my career as a therapist. I think that that's the that that's what's so different about your work. I think you know when we think about therapy, it was always this um, there was this veil of what was going on behind the scenes, and you bring it out into the open and say, "Here, let me show you." and you, you're not afraid to show your humanity. And so one of the things that I think in this book that comes out is this idea of being really aware of your age and um, not only the people around you dying, but the fact that um, you have a heart condition. And in fact, at the time that Marilyn had just been in the ER for um, a bad reaction, a, an almost life-threatening reaction to one of her treatments, um, you were told to go to the ER because you needed a pacemaker and your doctor ordered you to go immediately. Um, and so you have said that you feel like the way that you're going to die is the way that your father died, which is of a heart attack. That's your idea of how that's going to happen for right. you. But one of the things that, that really moved me was, um, and really made me think, was this idea where you said you were there when your father died. You were a, a young medical student, I believe. And, um, and you watched him die and there was nothing you could do about it. And, and then you talked about the fact that when people die, um, there are only a few generations of people who, who know them, who actually knew them. And you said, no one will have memories of him, meaning your father, as a material being. And in a few generations, no one will have memories of you as a material being, right, of yourself. Um, what comes up for you when you think about, about the end of your life? How do you feel about it now, having watched your wife go through it? How do you feel about your own end of life? Well, I, I'm having a real change. And for one thing, I have had a lot of death anxiety in the past. And it's very interesting to me now that uh, I, I see I have virtually no no death anxiety now. Uh, it, it, it seems to have just vanished. I'm so surprised at that. Um, so so, so what, what's, what's behind that? You know, for, for one thing, I have uh, on more than one occasion, had the experience of uh, of joining Marilyn. I think of my dying, and then it suddenly occurs to me I'll I'll be joining Marilyn. Now I'm I'm not a religious person. I've, I've been a pretty devout atheist since I was an early age. So the idea of, of joining Marilyn is preposterous. I know it doesn't make any sense, but nonetheless, the idea of joining Marilyn uh, when I die gives me relief. It's, it, it doesn't make any sense, but still it offers me comfort and gives me a good idea, a really good idea of what religions have had to offer to human beings since the beginning of time. There's always a sense that there'll be, it won't be ending, there'll be a continuation in some way. So, so there's, there's, there's the idea of, of joining Marilyn. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's in part uh, the answer to your question. I think the, the other thing that you write about and have written about for so many years is this idea that if we live a life that where we feel fulfilled, that we have less death anxiety, which seems almost counterintuitive. You think if you have a life where you're really engaged, that you don't want it to end. But what you're saying is that the more regrets you have about your life, the more anxiety you have about dying because you didn't live out your life in the way that you had wanted. Yeah, I, I, I'm relying on that, that formula so much now in a lot of consultations. I've been seeing a lot of people with, with death anxiety, and I, I almost automatically quickly go into the whole question of regrets uh, in life. Um, and I feel the, the greater, the, the more regrets one has about their unlived life, the, what they, the kind of life they could have done, they should have done, I think the greater is the death anxiety. So I almost always try to, to take a look at, at, at regrets about their life. Uh, I, I have very few regrets about 
the way I've lived my life. Been so fortunate to have spent it uh, with this remarkable woman. Um, uh, as I go and look at the, the books I've written, uh, and I read them over again, I'm so pleased with them. I, I've succeeded more than I possibly could ever have imagined doing that. So I have virtually no regrets about the, the way I've lived my life. And, and I think uh, that's, that's becoming evident now in the lack of anxiety that I have about, about my own death, which can't be too far away. I'm, I'm, I'm older than anybody else I know. Older than those 12 young Turks that started the apartment at, at Stanford, and I'm the only one left. That, that's enough to shake me up. <laughs> Let me ask you something perhaps personal, but I, I'm sure that you'll be game to answer. Um, you know, when I think about this book, A Matter of Death and Life, I think that on the one hand, it's this incredible meditation on, on loss, but I think it's also an incredible meditation on love. And I, you know, in a way, I think in your writing, you've always put Marilyn on a pedestal, you know, you've sort of idealized her. And I'm sure as a therapist, you would say to that patient, if you were your own patient, um, you know, nobody is a saint. And so, um, I'm sure you had difficult times in your marriage, and I'm wondering what lessons you can share with us from you know being together for over 60 years. What was a difficult time in your marriage, and how did you? What would you say was the lesson about long-term love that that you learned from getting through that hard time and growing through it together with Marilyn? Ah, uh, such a difficult question. Um, I, I never was not in love with Marilyn. Uh, she had so much to offer, but I'll, I'll confess to the world for the first time, she was a terrible cook <laughs> and did not like to do any cooking in the kitchen. There were certain things that she didn't do. She was a scholar. Uh, and, um, and alas, her, her field of expertise was in French, uh, especially, but also in German. She had a uh, her degree was in comparative literature at Hopkins. Uh, and she often said, and she was t absolutely accurate about this, that I have somehow managed to mispronounce every French word I ever encountered. I've got, I'm terrible in languages. I was desperate to get straight A's in, in my undergraduate school uh, to make sure I could get into medical school very quickly and only have to go three years so I could marry Marilyn earlier. Um, uh, the only B I got in undergraduate school was in, was in German, uh, so I've always <laughs> lamented that, but it was enough to get me into, into medical school. So, um, I guess what I'm curious about is that you, you had this, this long marriage and, and there was so much love between the two of you and you, you, you lived your entire, not only adult lives, but, but starting as teenagers mm -hmm. lives together. And I'm sure that there were times when, you know, people go through things. And because you share so much of yourself, and I think one of the things that that makes your work and what you share about grief and love and death and loss and regret and all of those things um, so relatable is that is that you're human. Mm -hmm. And there's not this sense of you being the expert up on high, but you being a fellow human in the trenches. You, you, you call people fellow travelers. Yeah. And so I just, I wonder, and I feel like you're almost a little bit maybe skirting the question, but, I, I am. Um, I but, am. but you are, um, but I just wonder if, if you could share maybe one example, you know, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, too personal, but just an example of something where, you know, the, the, what, what did you and Marilyn disagree about? What, was there ever a tough time in your marriage? Because the, 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 it's such a beautiful marriage. Your book recounts this marriage as just being full of incredible, it just it's it's love it's respect it's admiration um it's deep caring it's compassion um and i think what what makes it even richer is knowing that you know there were also times of struggle can you can you recount just one example of a time of struggle and and how you how you two got through it yeah, I, I think I can think of one time I could talk about. There is something in me that doesn't want to say anything that's negative about her, and I can't, I can't quite overcome that right now. But I just, I just don't want anything to to think less of her. But there's this one incident. 
she she was a uh, professor of French in, uh, at a nearby university, but then Stanford offered her a position to to come to, to come to Stanford and and sort of be in charge of the women's program there, uh, and there was a women's center at Stanford. So she began to transfer over to that, and she was so engaged and delighted to be at Stanford, even though she wasn't in her own familiar territory of, 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 of French literature. But she was soon so engaged in that, and there were always groups of women at her home. And, she, and I, wasn't, I wasn't getting much out of the marriage at that point. And that was our, our worst point at, at all. And I can remember, I, I think I wrote about it in the book or maybe in another book. But uh, I, at that point, I, I, we were drifting apart. And I went to, uh, we, we were at a restaurant in, near our, our apartment that we had in San Francisco. And I, I perhaps brought it up at the wrong place. But I, I brought, and I said to her, you know, Marilyn, I, I'm not getting much out of, this, out of this marriage any longer. And I'm just wondering whether or not we should stay together. Uh, I may have even put it harder than that. But what her response was, oh, it's hard to, hard to talk about. She started to wail loudly in this restaurant. Everybody in the restaurant was turning around and looking at us, and she just didn't stop. Uh, it went on and on. We, we left the restaurant. Everyone was looking at us. But that was perhaps a real crucial point, taught me about what I shouldn't say. And it taught to her what she shouldn't be doing. And our relationship got much better after that. And we weren't having quite as many uh, meetings with 20 women over our house all the time. And she began to spend a little bit more time in it attention uh, uh, to me at that point. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's so important to see the, you know, the, the nuances of a marriage, um, mm -hmm. because th this book is so much your love story. And I think that that story that you just shared is another example of, of a love story and what happens in a love story. Um, I think we have some questions from some people okay. uh, in the audience or in our virtual audience. Um, do we have that, Ted? Yes, yes, we do. Um, okay. First question, um, the gentleman says, every therapist I have had uh, has mentioned your name and your books. Uh, what does it feel like to have had so much influence in the field? Well, uh, that's, that I, that's, that's a very good question. That's, that's really close to my interior. Um, you know, we, we talked a little while ago about um, uh, about my own therapy, and that's something that I, I talk about a good deal in my therapy. Somehow I get, uh, it's very moving for me to hear people say like, talk like that, but I get about 30 to 50 uh, 30 to 60 emails every day and a great many of them are saying that same type of thing and I look at them and I put a star by that and I put it in this file and someday I'll go back and read them all what happens is though that they don't go very deep uh, you know it I, I wish they could go deeper I could hear that louder there's a part of me that is not able to quite hear that and that that's part of the things I'm working on in my own therapy and I think that it's probably a, a result of the the trauma I had in my very early life and and how I how I grew up so I think I think that's related to that I, I wish I could wish I could hear this I hear it from so many people and of course it, it feels wonderful to me but I just wish it would go more than a half inch deep next question is sort of really so that's that's the answer to that's the answer to what laurie is asking me a little bit what am i working on in therapy that's a big topic uh, a related question uh, a lady says you're an esteemed therapist providing um counsel to many people and now i read uh, from your book um that you are receiving counsel uh, so what is it like as a therapist to set aside being a therapist and allow yourself to receive therapy? Well, I, I like it very much. It's a wonderful, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful experience with, for me. And um, 
You know, I'm I'm a writer as much as I am a therapist. I, I I've been a writer all my life. There are times I have fantasies. Oh, should I have been a should I have been a novelist? Did, did I go into the right field? But I almost always say, well, if I had been a novelist, I wouldn't have anything to write about. You know, my field is is getting me so much closer to the the, the real center of our lives. So. Um, so I, I I do I do work on that uh, you know a, a good bit in my therapy, and uh, um, so so am I answer well, go go back and ask me that question again. This is what I mean by my memory flaking off. So what was the end of your question? The end of the question is is how do you allow yourself to not be the therapist and be the recipient of the therapy? Uh, hmm. I have no problem with that. It, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. I get all, all, all the help I can. I've been in a, there's been another kind of therapy I've been in. Oh, something like, oh, maybe 35 years ago. Uh, I and one of my colleagues, we organized a therapy group for therapists. Uh, and there was no leader. I was not going to be the leader. And we got started with a group of about seven or eight of us. And we've been meeting for an hour and a half for uh, over 30 years. Uh, and that's another kind of therapy I've done. We all have profited by this. And, uh, and, and I, I have a feeling that almost anyone can really profit from, from looking at ourselves and always learn, from, always learn from, from peers about how we're dealing with others and bringing up certain things. So um, I, I, have, uh, I have no problem uh, trying to get some help from therapy at this point. All right, another question. I, I feel often when a loved one is ailing and it's clearly, is clearly not gonna make a recovery that the grieving sometimes starts before they've departed. I used to feel that was the healthy approach to dealing with the inevitable. Now I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Did you comment? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the spouse it gets or, ordinarily gets uh, very much uh, closely involved at the very beginning of the illness, and we'll 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 hear about the prognosis really from 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 the patient's doctor. I was certainly like that with Marilyn. Uh, I was an MD myself and had a pretty good idea of this disease. Although until the very end, I was hoping that she would be one of these people who would really respond to some of the new drugs that were out in the field and she did not uh, but um but i i, I think it's I, I think it's necessary to to have someone else who knows about her illness or who knows about the the husband's illness uh it's it's a it's a terrible thing i think to face death all alone uh, and uh, uh, I, I really feel for those people who who don't have another person who they can they can share that. Uh, to me, that's one of the uh, horrors to think about of of someone going to going to their death ab absolutely alone in that way. Can I can I say something about that? Um, Please. Or one of the things that you said uh, um, in another conversation we had was that your therapist said to you that losing a spouse is like an amputation. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. And, and, and I was thinking about when it started to feel like an amputation and reading your book, it feels like going to this person's question that you did have this anticipatory grief, that you were feeling like um, you were already grieving the future loss of Marilyn once you realized what her prognosis was. Yeah, yeah. And there were lots of ways that you did that. Um, but I think that it was after she died that you really felt the amputation. Would you say that was the difference between the anticipatory grieving and then the grieving you did after she died? Yes, I think so. And and I, I love that quotation too, because I was talking about, I was thinking about for a while in my own self of getting over this grief, of getting working through it some way. And and I don't know where I forgot where I first heard that quote. It was something that my therapist used, but the idea that you really don't get over this kind of grief. You don't get over it. It's like getting over an amputation. You don't get over an amputation. You somehow learn to live with with the amputation. And and for me, that is perfect as I think about how you how you grieve with someone that you really love this much. You don't get you don't get over it. You just learn to how to live with it. And I think that's something that is very helpful. It's helpful to me as I think about the grieving process. I'm not going to get I'm not going to get over this. Uh, I, I'm not going to return to some other state. I'm just going to have, learn to what it is to, to live with without without Marilyn. 
Next question, there are several questions similar. I'm just gonna use one of them and, and see, see if you can help us with this one. Lady says, I lost my husband of 44 years two months ago. Uh, I was his caretaker for about a year, which was vastly different from the previous years. Now I'm in limbo, trying to see my next phase without rushing it. Any thoughts? Yes, I, I, my first thought is immediately she, she, she I, I hope that she'll get some help with that. Uh, and there are different ways to get help. One is a therapist. And there are, there are such things as bereavement groups that would be very helpful to her. If she can find a, a group like that in her community, I, I, would, I would urge her to, to look at that. That offers a great deal of assistance for that. So it's, it's hard to do that all, all by oneself. Uh, I hope she'll get some help with that. We see that so much in therapy where someone was the caretaker and they didn't focus on themselves because they felt like I, my needs aren't important because this other person has needs that are so much more pressing than mine. Yeah. And then the person is gone and they're lost because yeah. they haven't focused on themselves at all. They haven't thought about themselves, their needs, their wants, their desires in a very long time. So I hope this person is able to get some help focusing on her needs and wants and desires that have probably been neglected for a very long time. That's right. And that person is not going to get much help from the ill spouse. You know, uh, they've got to get some help from, from someone else, being close to someone else. And I hope there are such people in her life or possibly a group for, for her. Two final questions. Um, stories are such a wonderful way to celebrate and share our past. Any ideas on how we can use stories to better help those ailing? Do we want them to be telling them or do, do we want them to be listening? Uh, which do you think is more helpful? My late father took much joy in telling stories when we gathered around him in his last months. His memory was failing, so there was serious factual issues with his stories, but he seemed to do better when he had a chance to tell stories. I, I love to tell stories and I love to hear stories as well. Uh, and there's a, a long storytelling tradition back to the beginning of our species and uh, recorded history. So yes, I'm I'm uh, I, I I'm in love with telling stories. In the book I'm writing right now, uh, I'm, I'm, I do see for the last year I've just been seeing single consultations, and every I don't know at first it was every ten maybe it's now every fifteen or twenty consultations I do a story emerges that I feel will be so useful to other people who who uh, could read about these stories or perhaps to, to other therapists. So I've been writing a, 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 a book, uh, maybe pages, maybe six, seven page short stories that I think might be useful for therapists in their training or useful to others who, who are in therapy too. So uh, there's a storytelling tradition, I think, since the beginning of our, of our species. Our final question. Um gentleman says, I want to know if you and Marilyn had any specific rituals you shared, um, either things you said to yourself on a regular basis or things you did, or was it a drink at night or was it a walk to a certain place uh, or was it, was, it, was it a certain place you visited with some regularity? I, I feel rituals contribute to the, the health of a relationship. Hmm. Well, what kind of ritual I think about is one of the great advantages of being in academia is that you get sabbaticals. And uh, I, I took every sabbatical possible uh, and sometimes even extra ones without, without pay. But we would go off and, and our own agreement with each other is that she could pick where we're going to spend half of that time and I'll go and I'll pick the other half of time. My choice was always uh, to go to uh, uh, a beautiful island where I could go diving, uh, scuba diving or spear fishing. Uh, so I love the beaches uh, very much. Marilyn did too, but when she had her part of the choice was always to go to Paris. And so we, we, we combined these two. And uh, I wasn't in love with Paris that, that she, in the extent that she was, but uh, but nevertheless, I, I I spent half my time there, and I was always writing a book, and she was writing or, or meeting with her friends. I had a little revival of that just just uh, uh, last night and the night before because I was watching the Heming I mentioned I was watching the Hemingway. Uh, series by Ken Burns on television, and there are lots of shots of, of, of Paris, and it moved me very much to see these streets that we were uh, at walk with, with Marilyn. So uh, 
so Marilyn, Marilyn loved Paris, and, and I, it grew on to me too. So that was one real uh, tradition that we had. Uh, uh, and Marilyn never wanted to miss her, her time in Paris, and I never wanted her to do that either. As a final thought, Irv, could you share, you do have a ritual that has started since Marilyn died, and you talked about how it's hard for you sometimes to look at the pictures that you have around the house of her because it, it's very painful, um, but you go to this park bench, um, I think every day, and, and you yeah. sit on the bench and you kind of commune with Marilyn, right? Yes, I, I hate to admit that I do that, but I really do it. Uh, there's a park, uh, it's called Bowles Park, for those of you who know Palo Alto. It's just a, a couple blocks from my home, but in there, there are about eight benches. And if you pay the city enough money, uh, you can put a plaque up on each of the benches. And there were a couple of open benches that didn't have a plaque. So I, I chose to get one, and I have this nice plaque that, that I wrote something on. My, my children wrote part of that, too. And I go and visit her every day, usually after my day's uh, writing, uh, somewhere around 5 o'clock. I, I, I take a walk up there, and I sit there, and I just, just kind of communicate to her. Uh, sometimes I even talk to her a little bit when no one's watching. Uh, and... Uh, Yes, I, I, that has become very much a part of uh, music. I, I say to myself, well, I got to take this walk. It helps me sleep better at night. I can't be sitting writing all day long. Uh, but, but the truth is, I, I just wouldn't miss joining her for that, for that short time. Yep. Well, thank you to both of you. Thank you, Irv. Thank you, Lori. Uh, thank you to those of you who sent in some questions. Again, Irv's book is A Matter of Death and Life. And Lori's latest book is Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. <laughs> you can purchase their books wherever books are sold. <laughs> Go on gently. <laughs>